Welcome, Dr. Chase Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Here with Jordan Hagedorn. He's got his own podcast that I really enjoy and I hope to be on. I hope to qualify to be on at some point in the future. Uh, and he cares about uh, this hobby, this industry, and is a, a passionate 30 something with great ideas. So we're going to tap into some of that of how he sees the hobby uh, now and uh, going forward. And, um, and I'm going to try to chime in. We'll have a good conversation about that. But first, thanks sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Hudson Scott Auctions, Upper Deck, Panini, and Tops. All of my sponsors, Jordan, are interested in, uh, are for the hobby <laughs> and, and uh, want the hobby to prosper and uh, expand uh, reasonably and grow, be prosperous on, on many levels, be enjoyable. And you've done a really interesting podcast where you're tackling those kind of topics. So from your vantage point, what does the hobby need to do to position itself for, for further growth and enjoyment? Uh, if you were in charge or you had you know, the, 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 the influence that, that uh, people thought I had that I don't think I had back in the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s, but um, you know, I certainly wanted to be a force for good too. So tell me about your platform for the hobby and, uh, and how you're using that for good and uh, how you'd like to see things happen in the hobby. And welcome to the show, Jordan. Thank you. First of all, thanks for having me, and I appreciate the kind words. I think the key with the hobby is to just love it. And I always loved cards as a kid, and I bring that same love and passion to the hobby now in my mid thirties. And and I believe that's the most important thing is to just love the cards and love the connections you make, and and have some goals and have some things that you're chasing, and and have clarity. So I started for the hobby. It's a podcast. It's an Instagram. We're hoping to do some other content in the near future and a book and maybe some short films and things that really bring attention to the hobby. So to answer your question, I think it's it starts with the love of cards and the love of connecting with people who have cards and are like-minded. And so that's always been the focus is to bring attention to the positive side of the hobby and to find ways to bring people together to continue to nurture and foster that love of cards specifically. And then phase two of that is to bring people together to help them find the cards they're searching for. So there's something beautiful about the internet and Instagram and podcasts and social media that really brings this tribe of people really, really close together. And those connections continue to grow year after year. And it, it's been one of the biggest joys of my life uh, being in, back in the hobby from 2014 to now. Uh, and I'm super excited for the growth to elevate and, and uplift the hobby into the future. So you're talking about uh, evolution, not revolution. You're, it's, again, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but I mean, you're, you're building on the platform that was established in the, in the earlier days and you're adding on and, and making good use of the modern tools. Yeah, I think that's the key is to find your platform. You've talked about doing a podcast because voice is your thing. And I think it will evolve to video and or some people are written word. You know, I'm working on a piece for Slam Magazine, which will be just written word. So it's all about finding your your ability to express your passion and your emotions and your whatever it may be that comes to you about the hobby. And so I found that with a podcast. I, I'm working on cranking out more episodes here as we speak, uh, but also being on other people's podcasts and connecting and sparking conversations you, know, you have your hobby dinner and amazing conversation with a, a really passionate group of collectors. So it's just taking the lead and, and being proactive to be able to bring people together to talk about these topics that instead of just talking about your cards, talking about the future of the hobby, how we can uplift it, how we can grow it and evolve it. Um, and some of the things that we could do with the card brands and certain collectors. And we did it with three Jordan cards during the last dance. And we curated it. We had people submit their three favorite Jordan cards using hashtag three Jordan cards. Chris from the House of Jordans helped promote it. And we had over 160 entries. We ended up narrowing it down to 32. We had a vote leading up to every week of the last dance, and then we crowned a champion. So Grant Slayton, who's known as Waldorf Stories on Instagram, actually won, and we sent him a trophy and had a lot of fun with it. So it's things like that where a lot of people enjoyed it, and you read so many interesting stories that were then curated by Chris and I, who are obsessed with Michael Jordan and, and community. So uh, it's been really fun to grow, and I'm, I'm very excited about new people coming into the hobby. We're going to have content creators and video guys and podcasters, and now you have investors. And so it's just it's such a dynamic, nuanced hobby. And there's some really, really intelligent people coming into it that uh, I'm very excited about. And uh, it takes things to a new level. I think you've even seen that over the last probably six months to a year. There's been a lot of interesting people kind of getting involved. And there's getting to be more mainstream media coverage on the hobby as well. You just mentioned a number of uh, sharp people who participate in this stuff. My question to you, again, in this new day and age, how many of those have you personally met? Um, half? A bunch of them. Yeah, about half. Yeah, I mean, being at the National... I've been able to uh, connect with them. I, I ran into Chris, Christina, and Brian out in LA. I was out there for an event with Kawhi Leonard and uh, had dinner with them. So yeah, I mean, a lot of it's Instagram. A lot of the people I interact with is probably 75% just on Instagram. Um, but then you personally text them and get to know them a little more. But um, the show, I think the national, you'll start seeing more meetups and more people meeting there. I, I think it means 
that shows may actually have more prominence, bigger shows. What I'm seeing, and I, for many years I went to Comic Con because we we had uh, non sport entertainment products and had uh, uh, you know a presence at, at Comic Con in San Diego, and you just had to be there. You know, you couldn't like you know, tell you about it. You just had to be there, and it was overwhelming. And it's possible that the sports card, uh, you know, what when I talked to John Brogy, uh, the, the the manager, the the GM of the of the National Sports Collectors Convention, I said, you know, if if this December national works, you have the potential to have July and December two nationals uh, every year. You know, and what and then you now you don't have to be you, you could move it around the country. Uh, but I could really see, you know, that the importance of the ability to meet up in person, I think is, I mean, it was the only thing before. Now it's not the only thing, but it's, I just think people are going to be so excited about getting together with their kindred spirits that they know virtually because it takes the next level when you're out in LA and you're, you're, you're making friends that they're, they're absolutely kindred spirits with Brian and Chris and Christine. Yeah. It's always nice to put a face with a name. But more specifically, there's nothing better than shaking someone's hand, saying hello, looking at cards, and just talking and vibing out. Maybe you grab a beer and you just kind of come together. So I agree. I mean, it's an amazing concept to have two nationals. That would be a monster, and people would well, love two, that. Two major get-togethers. Like there, there are already now. And again, I, I'm a big one. You know, we're talking about how the hobby would be better. You can respond to this as well. I mean, I've said in some recent episodes, I'd like to see more coopetition. You know, that the card companies would compete where they have to compete, but 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 cooperate where they um, where they can in order to make the pie bigger. And so now we have, you know, that my old company has a summit, but so does tops. So does upper deck. And those are winter. Those generally were fall or winter um, type events. And if, 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 if there was one, if they rotated or took turns and had one big event uh, and people came together, I just think people are going to want to come together. And uh, on the other hand, Jordan, I got to tell you, I don't think my generation is going to be shaking hands anymore. We're at risk. So maybe, maybe hands elbow bump, elbow bump or fist bump. Yeah, that your, works. Your your generation is is probably f- pretty fearless. But uh, in light of that, you know, when when your generation again, if you're in charge, what do you say to the to the promoters of these events that make it uh, uh, something where you're not concerned about going, having a good time, and being safe and not getting sick? Is there anything yeah. that your generation looks at, or they just don't worry about it? I think you can wear a mask. I think you have to keep your distance. I think the key is to like you said, do a fist pump instead of a handshake and, and you just have to have the tables a little further apart. But I think that'll, that'll pass. I think it'll be okay. I think they could do the temperature testing and things like that. But uh, I think wherever there's cards, there will be people. Uh, some will ignore it. Some will, you know, take the proper precautions, but I think it'll come back. I think things will evolve nicely where, where we'll get back to somewhat normal here, hopefully in the, the coming six months or a year. I, uh, I will make a prediction. Uh, I think that the, the, sh- the ne- this first round of shows that are coming back, uh, do you agree with me that attendance will be greater than they were before? You know, the same show this July or August, I believe, will have greater attendance, maybe less dealers because they, they won't let the room be crowded with dealers. But I'm I'm thinking there's going to be a more collectors and customers coming than than comparing to the previous year. Would, I think that's a good prediction. I agree. I think people are clamoring to get out and be back in society, but also cards have been hot. A lot of people have come in. I think to answer your first question of what the hobby can do to continue. I think we, when those people are there in person, we need to make sure that cards are getting into their hands. I think you're seeing a, a huge price increase in wax and, you know, being able to rip boxes and, and even the singles have been crazy, but there's something great about just getting beautiful cards in your hands, whether they're nineties inserts or base cards or whatever it may be. So <clears throat> I think when people do get back into the fold, I think they're, the brands need to focus on getting cards into the hands of the younger people and people that, I mean, you're seeing some of these boxes that have been 50 to hundred bucks going for 300 bucks. And I think it's just crazy. Um, and, and I think that'll drive some people away and price some people out. So I, I hope this doesn't become a, a rich man's hobby. I think the average Joe and Jane, I hope can stay in it and find ways to get cards in their hands. And I think there is a responsibility with the brands and, and even Com C and Burbank sports cards and things like that to try to work with, I know it's supply and demand and the market determines the price, but yeah, I would just hate to see some of these younger kids get forced out because they only got 10 bucks and they can barely buy anything. Well, that's uh, okay. So address this. If you're in charge of the national, how do you work it so that, you know, one of the big draws of the national are the card company giveaways, but unfortunately those are not socially appropriately distant uh, lines. In fact, uh, you know, when uh, last year and the recent years, it's, it's, it's almost been gridlock because people are, are waiting for, you know, the free stuff, which is this sampling that, that you are talking about. I, I agree. It's very beneficial and it's a huge draw for the national, but is that in danger of being uh, nixed? 
I think the creativity will win. I think they'll find a way to make it happen and have a, a side, you know, side area where you can go through and one by one or two by two or whatever it may be, you can pick up those giveaways. And um, I mean, it is, this hobby is focused around dealing with people. And so they'll just have to get creative and find ways. But I think there's something about if people buy their tickets early, maybe companies ship those products to some certain people. And I think you find ways to, you know, if it's me, if I'm Panini or some of these brands, I, I find a way to have a Zoom call with 100 kids and 100 people and you start connecting individually with those kids. And then maybe they get mailed a ticket and they bring that ticket and one by one, they can get a giveaway at the national or something. But I, I think there's, you know, this from going to shows, there's so much fun and anticipation leading up to the show and connecting with people that by the time you get to the national, it's so good to see people. It's so interesting to see what the brands are doing. And so I think there just needs to be a little more marketing and a little more thought and creativity put into the pre-show, pre-national execution that then leads to when you get there, the process is really seamless and fun and interesting and, and just totally different than what you've seen in the past. Last question, because we're uh, out of time, but uh, thanks, Jordan. You wear several hats. One of them is a player agent. In, in, uh, in I think you're certified in football. and the whole idea of having autograph signers at shows has been upended a little bit. This, this first show in our area is not going to have autograph signers, but eventually they will come back. And if there's social distancing, I could see a silver lining there where if you have, uh, instead of an assembly line of just, you know, sign it and, and move on and it's going as fast as possible, that there'd be a little more engagement one-on-one -on -one, appropriately social distanced where, where you, you know, like with the, uh, you know, you, you'd be able to connect with the player a little bit and get the autograph, uh, maybe not pose for a, you know, a, you know, I guess they have social distance selfies now, but, uh, you know, something, but, but you might be able to connect with the player because you're not elbow to elbow and next and, and move, move along, Sonny. Um, do you, what, what would, what would Harrison say about that? Would, would he be pleased to have, have a, a more uh, substantive interaction with a fan uh, where, where, where the next person is six feet behind and, and they, they each get 15 seconds uh, for him to sign and, and say, how you doing? Or, you know, what do you think? Yeah. I think fortunately, you know, Harrison, who you mentioned my kicker for the chiefs who I represent, he, he's really good at signings anyway. So yeah. he enjoys that engagement, that interaction. But when I was younger, there were athletes that didn't even look me in the eyes, you know, you. sign the yeah. thing and moved on. So I agree. I, I hope that is the case. I think, I think, these athletes and, and anybody who's signing will appreciate the opportunity more because those things have gone away over the last few months. So I'm hoping that there is kind of a, an improvement in, in that customer experience. And I think, again, I think the key to all this COVID stuff is that the most creative athletes and brands and people who really focus on the experience and, and those moments, I think it, it calibrates everybody to look in the mirror to say, how are we handling these, these fans and people who are essentially helping pay our bills? So I hope you're right. And I, I do think that will be the case. I think if there are signers at the national or anywhere else, I think they're going to just have to find creative ways to have them set up and where the line goes and wearing masks and, um, and, and if there are even photos, how that all plays out. So I, I, I hope that is the case. Do you think other agents are encouraging their players like you are to, to be more fan, fan friendly in those venues? I hope so. I think it's a personality thing. Some athletes just aren't built that way. Yeah. They may be an introvert or, or they may not, you know, really understand. I think you see a lot of athletes, once they retire, they appreciate those fans a lot more. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you have guys that are making several million dollars, um, them interacting with a fan for a 50 or or $100 autograph just doesn't get them too excited. Um, a lot of times it maybe feels like a chore. But I've always told guys that I work with and friends of mine in pro sports that looking at Barry Sanders is incredible at this. He looks you in the eye, shakes your hand, asks you your name, signs it, gives you a smile, maybe offers a photo. Uh, and there's a reason he can charge 150 bucks for an autograph. I mean, he's one of the greatest of all time, uh, not only on the field, but how he carries himself. And, and I think a lot of athletes can take uh, cues and, and um, take a look at that. And hopefully they act the same, but unfortunately everybody has a different personality and, and you know how it is. I mean, sure. People ask you for your autograph. It's, you know, you pleasantly sign it and move on, but there are times you're maybe digging in the dollar box there. You're a little busy. So it's a, it's an interesting question. And, and I really just hope athletes do understand the privilege it is to be signing and, and getting paid to sign for fans. So. Agreed. And well, well said, uh, Jordan. Keep up the good work with your uh, For the Hobby podcast. I look forward to your next issue. Uh, thanks, listeners. We'll be back again tomorrow with another episode.